Okay, so welcome to this next video in the playlist on synaptic mechanisms. In this video, what we're going to talk about is complexins and neurotransmission. Okay, right. Uh, so, uh, the layout for this video then. Uh, we are going to uh, talk about the whole process through. So we're going to talk about uh, how synaptic vesicles dock at the presynaptic membrane. We're then going to talk about the role of complexins in preventing, uh, preventing the, um, the snare complexes from fusing the vesicles there and then. We're then going to talk about when an action potential comes along, uh, the calcium signal rises, uh, that causes synaptotagmin to become active, and we're then going to talk about synaptotagmin interacting with the complexins and um, changing their function from being clamping and anti-fusion to being pro-fusion, and we'll then integrate it together with the other function of synaptotagmin, because this is the emerging picture that's coming out, that there's not just one mechanism how, uh, leading to uh, vesicle fusion. There's lots of different proteins, all producing slightly different mechanisms that are all coming together to produce vesicle fusion. So we're going to gradually grow up our picture of this, and in this video we're going to expand it to include, incorporate these complexin proteins. Okay, right, so let's start off with an axon terminal here then. So here is our axon terminal. Okay, right, now wh when an action potential comes along and reaches the axon terminal, you get an extremely rapid release of neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft. In order for this to happen, what you have to have is you have to have synaptic vesicles which are already docked at the presynaptic membrane. So here are these synaptic vesicles that are already docked at the uh, presynaptic membrane. So I will fill them up with neurotransmitter here. Okay. Right, so we need to first look at the interactions which allow synaptic vesicles to dock at the presynaptic membrane. And by the way, synaptic vesicles which are docked at the presynaptic membrane are known as readily releasable. Well, they are known as the readily releasable vesicle pool. So it's a great store, it's store of uh, synaptic vesicles, and this store is known as the readily releasable vesicle pool. Okay, right, so we want to look at how we actually take a synaptic vesicle and dock it to the presynaptic membrane. And in order to do that, basically, what you have to have is you have to have proteins in the membrane of the synaptic vesicle which are interacting with proteins in the uh, membrane of the cell here, okay? And these proteins that interact are known as snare proteins. So all the proteins that are going to be involved in forming this complex, well, the main ones, are going to be called snare proteins. And the reason they're called snare proteins is that snare stands for snap receptor. Okay? Uh, and snap uh, is a protein involved in the recycling of snare proteins. And it stands for soluble NSF attachment protein. I'll have to write that down now. I've said it. Soluble NSF attachment protein, okay? And NSF stands for any malamide sensitive factor. Uh, but we're going off the topic now, so we'll stay close and we won't go into that at the moment. Okay, we'll have more videos on uh, alpha snap and NSF and their involvement in recycling vesicles later on. Well, in recycling snare proteins later on. Okay, right. So, Basically, snare proteins can be divided into two main types. Uh, the V-snares, down here, which are those snare proteins which are associated with the vesicle here, okay? And then uh, the T-snares, which are those snare proteins which are associated with the plasma membrane. So T, in this case, stands for target snares because the plasma membrane is viewed as being the target membrane in this case, because uh, the synaptic vesicle here 
is uh, trying to fuse with the plasma membrane. So the plasma membrane is the target membrane for fusion effectively. So that's why it's called, uh, well, why the snares that are in the uh, plasma membrane are called the T snares because they're on the target membrane. And V stands for vesicular. So those are the snares associated uh, with the synaptic vesicle membrane rather than the plasma membrane. So vesicular snares. Okay, right. So what actually are these V snares and T snares? Uh, well, basically, the V snare is a protein known as synaptobrevin 2. So I'll draw that here. So this, draw, this protein here uh, represents synaptobrevin, and then we're going to run out of space. Yes, just for the number, synaptobrevin 2. Okay, and I will colour it in orange. So synaptobrevin 2 has this membrane spanning portion down here, and then it has an alpha helix which extends into the cytoplasm of the cell. Okay, so that's synaptobrevin 2. Now, um, that's the only V-snare, the only vesicular snare. How the, there are two T-snares which are in the plasma membrane. So here's one, and this first one is going to be a protein known as syntaxin 1, and we'll colour this in blue here. So this is syntaxin 1, okay? Syntaxin 1. And then you also have a, another T-snare, which is known as SNAP25. So this protein is SNAP25. Okay? Right, and now I'll colour SNAP25 in um, turquoise. Now, syntaxin 1 has a very similar structure to synaptobrevin 2. It has a membrane spanning portion and then an alpha helix which stretches into the cytoplasm of the cell, where SNAP25 is different. It has a membrane attachment point and then it contributes two alpha helices, like so. Now, what's going to happen is these four alpha helices here in the cytoplasm, those are going to form what is known as a core snare complex, okay? So they're going to wrap around one another. In addition, what you're going to get is a point where you're going to get an ionic interaction. So there is a point of this complex so there is a sort of layer of this complex. So if you imagine all of these alpha helices lying in parallel, then if you slice through at a certain point, there's a point where all the amino acids that are at that level are interacting with each other ionically. And this basically is known as the zero ionic layer of the um, core snare complex. So this is the zero oh dear, ionic layer. Okay, and I think this is important to explain to you why synaptobrevin, you will sometimes hear synaptobrevin 2 referred to as an R snare. Okay, so this is notation that you will see occasionally, and it's called the R snare. And you'll sometimes hear syntaxin 1 and SNAP25 referred to as Q snares. Okay, now this is not, repeat, this is not just some different vernacular for uh, target and vesicular. This refers to the amino acids which they are contributing into this zero ionic layer. Okay, so let's discuss this in a bit more detail. So, R snare, the reason that synaptobrevin 2 is called an R snare is that the amino acid which it contributes into this zero ionic layer has a single letter amino acid code, R. Now, R is the single letter amino acid code for the amino acid arginine. So let me show you the structure of arginine, okay? So um, here we have the amino group of the amino acid up here. Here is the alpha carbon here, with a hydrogen here, and then uh, off the, well, the R group of R, well, actually, I'll draw the carboxylic acid group first down here. So that's the generic amino acid structure that's common to all amino acids. Then the R group of arginine is you have a methylene group, which is repeated three times. And because I can, can't be bothered to draw a methylene group three times, I will just put this brackets around it and then put three there. That's a useful trick. Uh, then you have a nitrogen next, and then a carbon with an amino group here, 
and then a double bond to a nitrogen down here and a hydrogen. Okay, now this is the structure of the amino acid arginine, which has single letter amino acid code R. There's a special name for this nitrogen here, which is double bonded to that carbon. This is known as the guanadino nitrogen. So this is the guanadino nitrogen. Now, the guanadino nitrogen has a lone pair of electrons here, okay? Lone pair of electrons. So nitrogen forms three bonds, and then, ba well, basically nitrogen has five electrons in its outer shell. It wants to get eight. So the way it does that is by forming these three covalent bonds uh, with three of its electrons involved in those three covalent bonds. Uh, but then the other two of the five, uh, the remaining two of the five, then form this lone pair over here. Now, basically, that lone pair is a centre of negative charge. So what can happen is a proton can come and associate with that lone pair, and that is going to overall give these, this sort of end, this terminal end of the, um, uh, of the arginine, it's going to give it a positive charge. Okay, and we'll continue our discussion in the next video.